facts on the ground, again, deep into the West Bank, uh, beyond uh, the separation barrier, uh, we feel compelled uh, to speak up against those actions. As I told John Kerry on Thursday, friends don't take friends to the Security Council. This is a day where the international community have utterly rejected the settlement activities, the policies of dictation, the policies of apartheid being employed by the, Israeli, the current Israeli government. And the election is the most undemocratic thing a president can do to tie the hands of his successor. Thank God in 25 days we will see a change in the American administration and also a change in American policy. A significant international crisis erupted on Friday when most Americans were paying attention to the holidays when the United States, in an unprecedented move, decided to abstain on a U.N. Security Council vote, a resolution that would condemn Israel for its settlements in the West Bank. It is a, a vote that will have lasting consequences, or will it? Let's bring in our panel now. Steve Hayes, editor-in-chief of the Weekly Standard. Mara Lyason, national political correspondent of National Public Radio. Molly Hemingway, senior editor at The Federalist and syndicated columnist Charles Krauthammer. How much damage is done as a result of this? Oh, this is very serious damage, and it cannot be undone because you can't change Security Council resolution without the acquiescence of the Russians and the Chinese, and you're not going to get it. But the Ben Rhodes statement you showed is so disingenuous. First of all, the idea that the Israelis didn't have a hand in this, the resolution shows up and they decide to abstain. It's ridiculous. Does anybody think that Venezuela and New Zealand spent nights slaving over the wording of this resolution. They were the ones who introduced it. Of course not. This was a U.S. operation all the way. And the problem is, if Rhodes is right, this was only about the settlements deep in the West Bank, way beyond the separation barrier. You could understand the vote, perhaps. But it's not. Every Israeli, left to right, is agreed that when there's a settlement, those settlements, in other words, when there's a peace, are going to be abandoned and torn down. Uh, Avigor Lieberman, who is the right-wing minister of uh, foreign affairs, lives in one of these settlements. He has said openly to journalists, I know it's so because I was in the room, that he would, and he lives in one of these settlements, that he would gladly evacuate and tear it down in return for peace. So there's no argument about that. But there are two other categories of settlements. The other are the close-in blocks near Israeli territory. Everybody agrees on all sides that in the event of a peace, they will go to Israel and Israel will give back in a land swap some of its territory to make the Palestinians whole. The pernicious part of this is the inclusion in the resolution of the term East Jerusalem. That was totally unnecessary. And it's completely illogical. It turns the holiest site in Judaism, the Temple Mount, the Western Wall, into foreign territory. That's, you know, people say it's the third holiest shrine in Islam. It's the first holiest shrine of Judaism. It's as if the UN passed a resolution declaring Mecca and Medina to be sovereign Jewish or Christian territory. It's absurd. It's an insult to the intelligence of the world and is supremely damaging to the Israeli claim to its own holy places. Molly, you just heard Charles say this. You heard Ambassador Dermer earlier in the program say that the United States was directly behind this and that uh, Israel has direct evidence or words to that effect that the United States is behind it, something that the United States government, the Obama administration, is vehemently denying. What do you make of this? Well, I think it actually isn't that important because what we know is that this happened and, it, and the U.S. could have stopped it if the U.S. wanted to stop it. You have the U.S. Uh, engaged in some pretty breathtaking, the Obama administration engaged in some pretty breathtaking taking dishonesty. They're saying that uh, they warned Israel that this could happen, that they couldn't do anything to stop it. In many ways, this is Israel's fault. The U.S. had every incentive to keep this from happening, and they had the ability to keep it from happening. So whether or not there's this other information is kind of irrelevant. We know that the U.S. wanted it, wanted it to happen because they allowed it to happen. And this is, causes huge problems for all sorts of uh, relations with, with Israel. It goes against U.S. policy. We've never before said that settlements are illegal, uh, as this, as this policy does. It makes things very difficult going forward. We've, con we've gotten 25 years of concessions from Israel on the condition that we would never allow something like this to happen. I mean, this is 
This is a major mistake by the Obama administration. Merle, what are the practical effects of all this? Well, I think actually they might be not as bad for Israel as people think because the Trump administration has a completely different idea about what to do going forward. Donald Trump has nominated an ambassador who's not for a two-state solution, at least that's what he said, and we know that Donald Trump says he wants to make this deal in the Middle East, but maybe the U.S. policy on Israel will be completely different, and maybe, as people are talking about in Israel today, that Netanyahu himself is going to have to decide whether he is for or against a two-state solution, which he has paid lip service to, but people don't know if he's really, really for that. Steve? Well, I think there are two points to make here, one looking backward, one looking forward. The first is about the Obama administration. I mean, this fits the pattern of the Obama administration, punishing American allies and accommodating American enemies. At the exact same time that this uh, controversy was unfolding, we posted a, a piece on the Weekly Standard website about new revelations in the Iran nuclear deal that the uh, Obama administration had sought to keep quiet. Uh, they were revealed in part in this piece that we posted on the Weekly Standard website. Uh, by the IAEA, new documents showing that the, the Obama administration had given sort of special accommodations to Iran as it pursues uh, its, its nuclear uh, program. This is, this is the way that the administration has happened. I mean, it sort of perfectly encapsulates the administration's approach to the region, I would argue. And the second point, uh, looking forward, is about the United Nations. I mean, I think this has the real potential to be a breaking point for the UN. This is the kind of thing that will bring together uh, center-right coalition of you know, isolationists, non-interventionists like Donald Trump uh, sounds like he will, will be, along with conservative internationalists who have just had it with the United Nations. You look back at the history of the United Nations, it's a history of presiding over genocides, accommodating authoritarians, excusing dictators. You think back to the oil for food scandal under Saddam Hussein. Kofi Annan went into that scandal and said, we can do business with Saddam Hussein's Iraq. And in fact, they did do business with Saddam Hussein's Iraq. This is what the United Nations has become, and its obsession with Israel, I think, is emblematic of a broader misplace of its priorities. Uh, to that point, Ted Cruz tweeted, uh, I think on, on uh, Christmas Eve, quote, spoke with Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu tonight to wish him happy Hanukkah and assure him of strong support in Congress. No U.S. dollars for U.N. until reversed. Charles, what do you make of that, and, and what kind of a movement do you see building in Congress or in a new Trump administration to start pulling money? from the United Nations. Well, most Americans are not aware of the fact that we pay about a quarter of the freight of the UN. So we're it's paying 22 percent something. We're like that. paying an organization that spends half its time, more than half its time, and energy and resources and bureaucracy trying to attack the only Jewish state on the planet, a tiny little speck, while genocide, mayhem, murder, terrorism is going on all over the world. It's an obsession that to an outside observer appears to be insane. Why are we doing this? And the rest of the time is spent undermining the United States and democracy and our allies around the world. It is an organization that exacerbates tensions. It does not assuage them. It was born in hope. The end of the Second World War it turned out to be a disaster. Any move to minimize our support for it any move to get it out of the U.S. Imagine if headquarters were in Zimbabwe, the amount of weight and coverage it would get would be zero. I think that's good real estate in downtown New York City, and Trump ought to find a way to put his name on it and turn it into condos. On that note, <laughs> next up, the panel breaks down the latest on the Trump transition.